who may enjoy a long life on earth. Father, do not that's great. <laughs> Thank you. Your children, instead, bring them up in the training and instructions of the Lord. In Ephesians 3, 16 through 19. I pray that our <clears throat> I pray that <clears throat> pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with the power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you be rooted and established in love that may have power, together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know his love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. So be it. Good morning. So we just did all this just to stir the pot is all we did it for. Because, you know, change is change. <laughs> some change is good, some change is bad, but change is change. And no, it probably won't stay this way because we can't get around there for Carl and his big tuba. <laughs> so we got to make room for Carl. But we don't ever want to reach a point where we can't change. Just ask Bonnie about Brent's church and where they try to do a nursery because the church is growing because Jesus is building his church and we've let our hearts get so far from God that we don't see him moving and we never ever want to get that way. When we see our kids coming and we're still on Deuteronomy 6, we're going to talk about that today. When we see our kids following and excited about their Lord about what God, their good, good Father has done for them so that they will praise Him, that they see all of nature crying out and they say, I can't be silent. I've got to cry out to God too for His love for me through His Son, Jesus Christ. And then they love one another, then that's what it's all about, training up our children to be disciples. That Deuteronomy 6, which became Jesus' great commission to go and make disciples thereof, it requires training loving, discipline, leading them to know the love of the Father through the Son. What a wonderful thing. So let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you because you are a good, good Father. You chose a nation to Father, and they were obedient. And you still were faithful, and they were obedient, and you were faithful more. And you, even in the total darkness when all hope was lost, you sent Jesus Christ, the light of the world, to die on the hill that he did create, to die as the very being that he created, to make us right with you. Let us realize that Satan has no dominion or authority anymore. It was stripped from him. He only has the authority that you give him and that we allow because we are a group of holy priests with a God living in and through us. And Lord, we just pray that you fill this place today with the Spirit, that you drive away any evil, anything that is not of you, that we learn to love one another, being patient and kind, keeping no records of wrongs, but thinking of others over ourselves, that we may fulfill the greatest command, that we may love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, body, and soul, and that will lead to loving others as Christ loved us and gave himself. And that others will see our love for one another and know that there's got to be something different about Christians. That there has to be a love from a higher form. That God first loved us and we're proof of that in the way that we live. Lord, open our eyes, open our ears, and help us to be obedient to your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So to clarify a few things too, a few announcements first. The box in the back is not a complaint box. <laughs> It is now the offering box also. We'll put offering on there if you want to do offering. It's for suggestions. 
It's for prayer requests that you don't want to mention in here. It's for needs. As God puts me in the different positions, I see different things. And, and I'll tell you about one right now. I've got two phone calls that I need to follow back up with from ministerial. There's a woman that needs bed, bedding. She needs shelving for her house. There's another guy that called me about a refrigerator. What's funny is that ministerial doesn't do any of those, those things. It's out of their guidelines. But yet they were sent to me from pastors of the churches that are part of the ministerial association. So I'm scratching my head. Why would you send me a need that you knew I could not fill? So I took it to prayer. And God said, you put that suggestion box out there, didn't you? Maybe your flock can fill it. Maybe someone has. So I'm announcing that now, and you can ask me more about it later. We want to let our light shine so brightly that others may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. We know that all good things come from the Father, that He has given us so that we can be rich in giving to others. If you're reading along in the Bible, you've seen this time and time again. If you're looking at what you're reading in the Old Testament through the eyes of a loving father who would give his son to save you, then you can see that this is a loving, loving God of the Old Testament. Not a vengeful God, but a God that does demand holiness of his people, that do does demand obedience, so that we're not called hypocrites by the world. We're not actors on the stage, but instead we're genuine in our faith, genuinely loving one another, and genuinely drawing people to salvation. Jesus said, if you're not with me, you're against me. If you're not gathering into the fold, you're scattering. Those are his words. The Son of God who came to live and die and set the example of obedience for you to follow in his footsteps. Just as he was obedient to the Father and gave up heaven to come and be with you, to be the light of the world, to love you. What a wonderful, wonderful Father we have. So we should hear and obey him. So today's scripture reminded me about that hearing and obeying. That Paul is writing again that we should train up our children. That that fifth commandment is a commandment that gives a promise, the first one that gave a promise, that if you and I train up our children and then they become obedient, they will have long life. Have you read that somewhere in Deuteronomy? <laughs> I think I have over and over again, that you may prosper in the land the Lord is giving you. And what greater promises has Jesus given us of eternal life? A place where there, it's not just a promised land. Ha <laughs> ha! There is no more tears. There is no pain, no suffering, no death. And I could go on and on and on. Everything that comes from the good, good Father will forever be in heaven for his children. That we are heirs with Christ. That we receive the inheritance that Christ received as long as we suffer and obey and show our love for the Father. Jesus said this. He said six words in Greek in John 14, 15. Your translation may have more than six because some of the words are tied together like you love is one word. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. If you love me. If you don't love others, John goes on to write that the love of the Father is not in you, that you're a liar and a deceiver. So, yeah, we do stuff like this to see if when we stir up the pot, if we get, hey, or if we get, ah, oh, so that we're not like a church that I know right now going on, that when God is bringing in family and there's a call for nursery where there's already money in the account, that there's division in the church and the church is in a split. How did we get our hearts so far away that we ever get to that point? So yeah, if I need to stir up or spur or whatever, I'm going to do that because I want to lead you to love one another as Christ loved you and gave up his life for you. And your life's not your own. It was bought with a price, the blood of Jesus Christ. It never was yours before Jesus Christ died for you. There was a creator God, sovereign, 
who created you for his purpose. Your life is his. And he calls for an obedient, holy, loving people who love him wholeheartedly. We saw that in Joshua and Caleb. And their children inherited the promised land with them. When Caleb went in, he still had to fight the giants in the land. We don't have to fight the giants when we go to heaven. Jesus already beat all of that on the cross. It is finished. And we will receive that inheritance. We will pass from death unto life. But Caleb said, give me that land now when he was 80 years old. He said, I'm still as strong as I was when I was 40. I don't know about you, my back's killing me at 50, whatever my age is. <laughs> he was as strong at 80 as he was at 40. And he knew he had to still go face the giants in that land. And he said, let's go do it so my children will inherit this land. Because he loved the Lord his God with all of his heart. When Jesus started his public ministry, he pulled out the scrolls from Isaiah and he said, these are about me. And then his words from Matthew 4, 17 were this. From that time on, Jesus began to preach. Repent, change your mind, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Change your mind so it can change your heart so that you will live for God. That you won't be like the history of the Israelites who were disobedient, disobedient, disobedient. The kingdom of heaven, a new promised inheritance for those who believe in Jesus Christ. It is here now. We don't, when we get saved, we, we're not done with this life. We are born again to live a new life. We are the hands and feet of Christ, the light of the world. Because the kingdom of heaven is at hand and will be here for all eternity. The difference now while we're living is we can draw people into the kingdom. When we're dead and gone, we can't do that anymore. When Jesus returns, there won't be any more drawn into the kingdom. What an urgency we have to train up our children to fear the Lord, to love Him at this point in our life. And we have the power that raised Jesus back to life, the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of us. So are you living by that power? If you saw my little car out there, I put inside of it a little red light. That was going to be inside the ichthus, was going to be the light of the Holy Spirit burning. But I had to glue it in beforehand, and my batteries ran out. <laughs> so when it raced down the track, it wasn't glowing. And you know, that just got me thinking. How many times are we racing down life's path, and you can see that in your bulletin with the paintbrush being drawn out, and are we trying to go on our own power but rather than the power of the Holy Spirit? Jesus Christ said it is finished so we wouldn't have to worry anymore. So we wouldn't have to try to live life on our own power. But that we could live by the Spirit. And then after Jesus says repent for the kingdom of hand is at hand, the kingdom of God is at hand, he calls his disciples to come after him and follow him, forsaking everything else they've known. Their world is turned upside down in their thinking philosophy. Their life is not their own. He calls them to follow after him and become fishers of men. Not to worry about what they lived for before, but now they're living for a greater thing. They're building up rewards in heaven rather than building up things and treasures here on earth. That means that we have to leave that world behind, that, that we don't consider the things once, as Paul says, were gained. Now we consider them as rubbish, as garbage. Garbage. That a true child of God loves him and is obedient to him to the finish line. <laughs> My little Ichthus car would go down at the end too, and it's got it had its weight up top. So at the end it would take and flip over. And that made me think, yep, our lives are flipped over upside down in Christ, aren't they? Because the things that we thought thought we were living for, <laughs> Let's live for him. In Matthew 13, Jesus says this. Well, first it says, The disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak in parables? That further teaching illustration that sometimes maybe you understand it, sometimes you don't, but it was a simple teaching illustration for that day, but yet the people who did not want to really hear God, who didn't really want to see God, but just one of the miracles that Jesus offered would be forever hearing and not perceiving, forever seeing, but not really seeing the truth. 
So he asked that of his his disciples came and asked that, and he replied, these are Jesus' words, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you, but not to them. You have knowledge of heaven to share with the world who doesn't have that knowledge. The difference of life or death, blessings and cursings. Verse 12, whoever has been given more, whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they will, what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak in parables. Jesus quotes from Isaiah, though seeing they do not see, though hearing they do not hear or understand. And we learned last week that, that hearing, that listening meant Obeying. There was not even another word for obey. The word was the same word. If I hear it, I obey it. If dad says take out the garbage, I do it. Because I love my father, I respect my father. (laughs) And then if we train up our children to love the Lord, there's a promise of long life, of blessings, instead of cursings. Verse 14, sorry I'm tongue-tied this morning. And then is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. You remember reading about Pharaoh, where he, Pharaoh hardened his heart against God? But there came a point where God hardened Pharaoh's heart also. Don't miss that in the story. Because God is still going to use even disobedience to bring him glory and honor. It's still his story. His will will still prevail. But his loving, obedient children will inherit heaven for all eternity. For this people's heart has been calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn. And faithful Father in heaven above would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, the disciples, the ones who have given up their life to follow Jesus, because they see, and and your ears, because they hear. So let's go backwards a little bit from Matthew 13 to Matthew 5, that first public speech that Jesus gave, sermon, whatever you want to call it, teaching. He taught to the crowds. He taught the Sermon on the Mount. And he starts out in Matthew 5, verse 1. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him. We've got two different people groups here. We'll see we've got even more than that. But you've got those who gave up their life to follow after Jesus, and you've got the crowds, the others. It's implied the ones that didn't. Wait a minute. The crowds was the word given to them. You had 12 versus thousands. You only had the 12 at this point that we know of. Jesus sends out more later. But the point is you have a small number and you have this large number. We want what you have to offer, but we want to stay on the throne and not make you Lord of our life. Yes, we want a Savior, but we're not willing to make you Lord. But the disciples said we will let you be Lord. We will take ourselves off. We will come after and follow after you, giving up our lives to serve you, to follow after your teaching so that we can be like our master, our teacher, our rabbi, and follow in his footsteps, training up our children to be future disciples so that they may fear and love the Lord their God with all their heart. So the crowds and disciples came to him in verse 2. He began to teach them. He said, blessed. Thirteen times Matthew uses that word. Nine are found right here. Wouldn't you rather have blessings than cursings? We're going right back to the Old Testament. Wouldn't you rather have that? I think I would. I want to be blessed. And here's what Jesus said. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed, Blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who persecute you because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Twice we've seen that now. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before them. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. If you're the salt of the world, whatever you want to take that to, simple teaching again, salt flavor, salt preserves, whatever, whatever you want to put to that. If you're not being salt, it's not any good anymore. Do you want to put salt on your potato that doesn't season it? No. You throw it out. And Jesus is speaking about your life as a Christian. You are the light of the world. And we get a second example. A light. Well, if I light, if it's a dark room and I light a light, do I hide it? That's just, doesn't make sense, does it? As Spock would say, do you know who Spock is? He's the one that does this. I got to do it this way. What? Star Wars. Star Trek. <laughs> he does this sign. Do you know what that sign means? Peace, live long and prosper. Hey, that's the name of the sermon title. With shalom, do you know what shalom means? Peace. It's the greeting that you would get if you go to Israel that means peace. Do you know what peace means? Wholeness, completeness. We are made complete in Christ to God so that we can have the peace that surpasses all understanding. Because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Did you know Spock did take this from Jewish? Look at your bulletin. Look on the left. What's the first symbol? It's the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, I think. It's called sin, not sin like you're thinking. Does it look like this? Ha! <laughs> When, when they were doing the greeting where they came to the planet and the Vulcan queen was coming out, I don't know the, the rest exactly, the director, Spock, or Leonard Nimoy, came to the director and said, we should have a greeting. Earthlings have greetings. Vulcans should have greetings. And he took this from his Jewish heritage, and look at that, the peace that's there. And people immediately started doing this all over the world. And if you, see, if you ever watch a Jewish ceremony, you'll see the priest doing this. Peace. It's the first letter in the word Shema. What was Shema from last week? If I hear, then I obey. Don't forget the obey part, Jacob. <laughs> huh. You didn't know that, did you? Okay, what verse am I on? The light? Yeah. Verse 14. You are the light of the world. A town, a group of lights that is built on a hill cannot be hidden. We're supposed to build our foundation on the rock. The rock sticks up above the sand so the rest can see. We're supposed to build this city of God while we're here on earth so that we can shine our light before men so that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. Verse 15, neither do people hear and not obey, right? <laughs> Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. As Spock would say, it's illogical. You get that one? Okay, it's a reference from Star Trek also. <laughs> it's illogical to light a light and then hide it. That's just, as children might say, plain dumb. It just, why would you do that? You are the light of the world. Not just here, the world. So that they may see you. But yet so many times we try to run the, the light, the, the race of this life without the light of God shining in us. Why would we do that? It's just illogical and dumb. Neither do people 
light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. And the first thing there is your house. That means your children will see the light first. Wow. Verse 16, In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the, or, or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will be by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever practices and teaches these commands will be the, called the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Over and over we see these rules for the kingdom of heaven. And whether you can be blessed and greater, or you can be not blessed and not as great, however you want to view it, or not even make the kingdom of heaven. You decide. I'm not going to go into all that. But I want to be the one that receives the blessings and the cursings going back to Deuteronomy and Joshua. The one who chooses life instead of death. The one who takes their children with them into the promised land. In Hebrews, where, they get, where the writer gives all of those hall of faith people, Noah built an ark for many, many years out of holy, reverent fear to God to save his children. That was not only his sons, but his sons' wives in there also. Was it a permanent fix? No, read on, which we have, and you'll see that, that at least one of his sons departed. But out of holy fear, Noah was obedient to God, and we're reading all through the Old Testament how much more faithful God is than we ever thought about being. So that's where I'm going to build up my treasures instead of building up with things on earth. That's where I'm going to put my faith rather than putting my faith in things, my success here, my health here, whatever it is. I'm going to put my hope on Jesus Christ. Fix my eyes on Him so that I can run the race the way He has called me to do it. So let's look at Deuteronomy. Chapter 6. If you're reading the NLT, you'll see a title that says, A Call for Wholehearted Commitment. Have you seen that pattern up to this point? You can't love God with part of your heart, with part of your soul, part of your mind, part of your strength, part of anything. You have to love Him with everything that He has given you. Starts this way in verse 1 in the NLT translation. These are the commands, decrees, and regulations that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. You must obey them in the land you are about to enter and occupy. And you and your children and grandchildren must fear the Lord your God as long as you live. If you obey all His decrees and commands, you will enjoy a long life. Listen closely, Israel, and be careful to obey. Then all will go well with you, and you will have many children in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Listen, Shema, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves half-heartedly. Somebody correct me wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again. Let's do it again. Again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road and when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands. Wear them on your foreheads as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your houses and on your gates so that you and your children will remember to love the Lord your God. Listen and obey Him with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength, and all of your mind. Now, notice mine's not there, but Jesus says mine. We'll talk about that in a minute. Starts with that word Shema, to listen and to obey. To do something different than that would be totally illogical 
and you're not going to have peace that surpasses all understanding. You're going to have cursings instead of blessings. You're going to be choosing death instead of life. These things were written as reminders to us. <clears throat> Listen, O oh Christian. Hear the word of God, the words of, the, of God that became flesh and dwelt among us. The Lord is your God. The Lord is one. You must love the Lord your God with everything. I've got a little video that I want to play for you that will explain a little bit more about the love that we're supposed to have for the Father because He loved us first. At least I think we do. <laughs> Another change. We're going to the laptop to play the video. For thousands of years, every morning and evening, Jewish people have prayed these well-known words as a way of expressing their devotion to God. They're called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our... We're going to look at the third key word in this prayer, how Israel is called to love their God. But what does that mean? Love is a very common word in most languages, as it is in ancient Hebrew. It's pronounced ahava. It most basically refers to the kind of affection or care that one person shows another. It sometimes describes physical affection, like the king of Persia's love for Queen Esther. But there are other Hebrew words that more specifically refer to physical desire or sex. Ahava is more broad. So Abraham had Ahava for his son Isaac, that's parental love. Jonathan showed Ahava for his friend David, that would be brotherly love. In fact, a whole group of people can have Ahava for their leader, like when the Israelites showed love for their King David. Ahava can even describe loyalty between political allies, like Hiram, the king of Tyre, loved David. They had good relations, and so Hiram wanted to help David's son Solomon build the temple. These are all different kinds of affection described with the one word, Ahava. Now all of this is helpful for understanding God's Ahava in the Old Testament. So in Deuteronomy, Moses told the Israelites, God showed affection for you, he chose you because of his Ahava for you. So God doesn't love because the Israelites earned it or deserve it. It simply originates from God's own character. He loves because he loves. This is why Jeremiah can say that God's love is everlasting. It has no end because it has no beginning. God's love just is an eternal fact of the universe. And God's love is not a duty, it's a genuine feeling, an affection that God experiences. This is why the prophet Hosea compares God's love for his people to a husband's ahava for his wife, or to a parent showing ahava for their child. It's one of the strongest things that God feels. But that doesn't mean that God's love is just a feeling. God's love is also in action. It's something God chooses to do. Like when Moses says, because of God's ahava for your ancestors, he brought you out of Egypt with great power. God's love isn't just a sentiment, it is something God does. And so, in the Shema, Israel is called to respond to God's ahava by showing ahava in return. And just like God's love, human love is to show itself through actions. Like in Deuteronomy 10, what does the Lord your God ask of you except to fear the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to love him and serve him and to keep his commands? All of these actions are centered around love. If I'm not doing them, I don't actually love God, I just say I do. Which leads to one last thing. In the Old Testament, I show my love for God by how I treat the people around me. In Deuteronomy, we read that God defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow, and he shows ahava for the immigrants among you, giving them food and clothing, and so you also show ahava for the immigrant. So the people are to imitate God's ahava by showing ahava for others. This is the idea underneath the famous line, you shall ahava your neighbor as yourself.
And so at the end of the day, all of this is rooted in God's own eternal ahava. Like we read in the New Testament letter of 1 John, we love because God first loved us. And that's the Hebrew word ahava. So if you hope sh- you're enjoying if you shema, if you hear and obey God's word, that shows that you love the Lord your God. If we have our relationship right here where we love God, then we can love one another. If we love one another, as John says, this proves that we are children of God and this relationship is right here. If we hear and obey, then we love the Lord our God. So there is a Shema prayer that is taught to all of the Israeli children, to the Jewish faith. And it starts with a Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, but it also contains two more components. And remember, this has been taught from Moses to the day of Christ, and it's still taught today. So you've got to remember when Christ comes on the scene that this prayer is being taught daily to their children over and over and over again. The next part is in Deuteronomy 11, 13 through 21. If you carefully obey all the commands I am giving you today, and if you love the Lord your God and serve Him with all your heart and soul, then He will send the rains in the proper seasons, the early and the late rains, so you can bring in your harvest of grain, new wine, and olive oil. He will give you lush pasture lands for your livestock, and your yourselves will have all you want to eat. But be careful. Don't let your heart be deceived so that you turn away from the Lord and serve and worship other gods. If you do, the Lord's anger will burn against you. He will shut up the sky and hold back the rain, and the grounds will fail to produce its harvest. Then you will quickly die in that good land the Lord is giving you. So commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these words of mine. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your foreheads as reminders. Teach them to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road, when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates so that as long as the skies remain above the earth, you and your children may flourish in the land the Lord swore to give to your ancestors. Do you see a pattern? Do you see God's promises if we listen and obey and love Him? Well, that's not all the parts to the Shema prayer. Numbers 15, 13, 15, 37 through 41 is the last part of this prayer. And they were able to quote all this prayer from heart. Then the Lord said to Moses, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. Throughout the generations to come, you must make tassels for the hems of your clothing and attach them with a blue cord. When you see the tassels, you will remember and obey. All the commands of the Lord, all the man's commands of the Lord, instead of following your own desires and defiling yourselves, as you are prone to do. The tassels will help you remember that you must obey all my commands and be holy to your God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt that I might be your God. I am the Lord your God. Are you hearing? Are you obeying? Are you teaching your children? Are you living the life of love that the Father has given to you to the world? That's what we're called to do. And the sacrifice that we have that brings us back to a right relationship with God is so much more than any offering that we can do of bulls or rams or anything else. We were bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. As Jesus told His disciples that He was leaving to go to prepare heaven for them, He said this in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Me. Are you hearing and obeying God and following in the footsteps of Jesus? I mentioned to you before that that this prayer was still being said when Jesus came on the scene, when all hope was lost, when Israel was occupied by the Roman Empire, when there seemed to be no hope, that God had not spoken to His prophets for hundreds of years. Then Jesus Christ comes, the light of the world. Well, this is the training that Jesus would have had. Bet Safar is ages 6 to 12. That's where they start getting their education in the synagogues, learning to read, write, and memorize the Torah. Memorize the Torah. That's the first five books of the Bible. 
Their goal was to memorize everything we've read thus far, pretty much. Okay? Remember where Jesus was at age 12? He was in the temple. Okay? Put that together. At bar mitzvah at age 13 for boys, the boy was deemed to be a man. He put into practice everything that he had memorized. Okay? From ages 13 to 15, they began to live out that life until they reached the point of Bet Midrash. That's the term where they have reached uh, adulthood and start practicing. From ages 15 to 30 is that age, and then you have Bet Tamad, where you are invited to study under a rabbi coming in at age 30. You study under that rabbi to become like that rabbi. The word means to eat, literally eat the dust of the person that you are following after. The dust. You consume everything so that you can be like your rabbi. And the disciples called out to Jesus and said, Master, Lord, Rabbi, because they were following after them. We don't understand that because we don't live our life that way. But everyone who took the call to follow Jesus in that day understood they were giving up everything. They had to have their world flipped upside down so that they could live for Christ, so that they could teach their children how to live to serve God, that their life was not their own, so that they could experience that Shema, that peace that surpasses all understanding. So in Luke chapter 10, Jesus sends out 70 or 72 disciples, depending on what your translation says. They reported back to Jesus. They were utterly amazed that demons listened to them in the name of Jesus. Wow! Cast out demons. But Jesus said, don't rejoice over that. Rejoice instead that your names are written in heaven. That hope that we have that no one else in history had been able to experience. That we have a home in heaven through Jesus Christ. Not a promised land that they had been looking back at and remembering and everything else, but an eternal home in heaven. And I'd like to read that for you. In Luke chapter 10, verse 17, the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submitted to, to us in your name. Jesus replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy, not some but all. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and unlearned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by the, my Father. No one knows who the Son... Excuse me. No one knows... Who the Son is except the Father, and no one knows who the Father is except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Then He turned to His disciples and said privately, so now He's not talking to the crowds anymore. Blessed, we get blessed again, that's why I started with that before. Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and many kings were not to kings yet, but we'll be there soon. We'll get to judges before we get to kings, see the pattern. But many kings wanted to see this, see what you see, but they did not see it. And to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. So you better listen and obey. An expert of the law came up, verse 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, Notice he doesn't say rabbi, he doesn't say master, he doesn't say lord. He says teacher, ironically probably. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says what is written in the law? How do you read it? How do you understand it? And he answers, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, and with all your mind. Notice his answer. Oh, we got four things, not three things. 
Because Jesus had already said you're mine because he was in the age of enlightenment and reason where if you followed after the Roman Empire and the intellect they had, that was what was superior, not God, especially not this God that would humble himself and die for you. So this religious expert put the Shema prayer together, Deuteronomy, with Jesus' words that were already taught. And he said all four of the things. He combined them. Okay? And then he said, love your neighbor as yourself. Yay! He's got the right answer. This guy's got it figured out. But what does he do? Does he hear and obey? Jesus answered to him in verse 28, You have answered correctly. Do this, hear and obey, and you will live. What was his question? What must I do to inherit eternal life? That's what Jesus' answer here. Hear and obey these commands that I have given you and receive blessings instead of cursings. Eternal life instead of eternal death. Oh, but look at verse 29. But this religious expert, and notice I put religious in there because he didn't understand the law even though he could quote it. He wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, Who then is my neighbor? Why did Jesus teach in parables? So that those who didn't want to hear and didn't want to obey would be forever hearing and never understanding. Forever seeing but not perceiving. You've got to assume that that religious expert never came to Jesus. We don't know. Hopefully he did. But at this point, he justified himself and said, I know all the answers. I've heard it over and over again but I'm not willing to let you be Lord. I'll try to get there on my own merit. But Jesus' answer was, Come, follow after me, and I will give you peace. You can drink from living water so that springs of water come up from you. You can live by the power of God instead of by your own power and might. Verse 36 and 37. Which of these three things, he's giving him the parable of the Good Samaritan. I'll leave that to go for you to read. But basically, you've got a priest. <laughs> Surely the priest will help this guy out. No, he won't. You've got a Levite. You know who the Levites are by now by reading. Surely he'll help him out. If the priest won't, maybe one of the closest necks of the priest will help him out. No, they didn't. In fact, they go to the other side of the road. Then you've got this Samaritan doesn't say the Samaritan's good anywhere, but we call it the Good Samaritan parable because we obviously see that he's the one. This Samaritan, this half-breed who doesn't know the truth, who lives between Galilee and uh, Jerusalem, who people went around out of the way in Jesus' time to not walk through their land because they couldn't stand them. Boy, that's brotherly love, isn't it? This guy helps this guy out. He spends his money, he spends his time, he comes back to check on him. Wow, that's a good Samaritan, isn't it? So Jesus asked the religious expert, verse 36, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of, your, your, of the robbers? He asked him, who is my neighbor, right? The expert of the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Correct answer again. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Don't be a hearer of the word and not a doer. Don't train up children, your children, your grandchildren in your hypocrisy. But instead train them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And he will be faithful. He will grow his kingdom. He will grow this church. We will know the peace that surpasses all understanding and our children will imitate our genuine behavior of our love for God. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for Jesus' words that he would humble himself and die so that we might live. Father, I thank you for the children that are here. I thank you for how Jesus will build his church beyond denomination. May we continue to grow. May we continue to do good works that bring glory and honor to you. 
And may you be faithful to our children and our grandchildren into the world and draw others to you. Lord, help us to be good stewards of the things that you've given us, to be rich to others as we're rich to God. And we just thank you for the blessing after blessing.